If you bottle the base of a white sauce, do you have a roux in preservation? Yeah, I'm a dad now. Hey internet, I'm Steve, welcome to Raffo. Hello and welcome to Scadriel, one of the few planets in the Cosmere where life was straight up created rather than just guided by shards. Interestingly though, it's also one of the planets with the least environmental investiture. Now, by that I mean compared to some of the other planets we know about, Cell, Roshar, Taldane, that have plant and animal life dependent on investiture, or where the landscapes themselves are inherently invested, the only interaction with investiture on Scadriel is that which is channeled by humanity. Don't get me wrong, Scadriel was originally created and has been fundamentally altered by Shardic intervention, but the day-to-day goings-on of the planet are fairly Earth-like, apart from the, you know, ash falling from the sky. Well, then again, to make up for the fairly familiar scenery, think France but with volcanoes, there are three hugely significant magic systems that are collectively referred to as the metallic arts, allomancy, ferrucamy, and hemallergy. Allomancy is the headline system of Mistborn and is the most straightforward of the three. Individuals with the genetic ability can ingest certain metals, then burn these metals, using them as a key to access specific investiture effects. People who can utilize a single metal are called mistings, and those who can use every metal are mistborn. Men who can't use any metals are called mister. At the beginning of the original trilogy, most people knew about 10 allomantic metals. These can generally be categorized in groups of four based on what they influence, with one metal and its alloy focused externally and another pair focused internally, the pure metal pulling and the alloy pushing. Each metal can then be described along that criteria, internal versus external, what it affects, and push or pull. The original 10 has four physical metals, four mental metals, and two high metals. As you'd expect, the physical metals can influence the physical world. Iron and its alloy steel allow the user to respectively pull or push on external sources of metal. Tin pulls on your senses, making them more, well, sensitive. And pewter pushes your physical strength and endurance beyond normal limits. The mental metals are a little more esoteric. Zinc allows a user to pull or riot the emotions of others, making certain feelings more powerful. Brass does the opposite, pushing on or soothing their emotions, dampening them. When burning a metal, allomancers give off invisible pulses that can be felt by someone burning bronze, the mental internal pushing metal. Called seekers, they can feel those pulses pushing against them. Those pulses can be hidden by an allomancer burning copper, pulling them back in, as well as blocking touches from someone with zinc or brass. The high metals both seem to influence a user's view of time, and both were really expensive. Gold grants an allomancer a vision of different selves they could have become if they had made different choices. Atium, a mythical metal mined from geodes in the Final Empire, is much more useful. A mistborn burning ATM will be able to see into the future by a few seconds, as well as increasing their ability to process and respond to that information. This grants them almost supernatural combat abilities, being able to see where opponents will strike and place their own attacks accordingly. During the Final Empire, it was believed that high metals were only usable by mistborn. Mistings of the other metals, however, were common enough to have their own names and specializations. This, to me, is where Sanderson shines. Yes, his stories are engaging, his character is relatable, and his curse words are storming brilliant, but his magic systems all make sense. Okay, it doesn't make sense that eating metal turns you into Magneto, but internally, everything follows its own rules. Take iron and steel, the external physical pulling and pushing metals. With every push, there is a pull. If a lurcher, an iron misting, pulls on an object lighter than they are, that object will come flying toward them. If they tug on something heavier, they'll be the one that moves. Same thing with steel mistings. They're called coin shots because they can push smaller, lighter metal objects away from themselves. Once those objects hit something with more mass, however, Newton says they push back. Scadriel may not have had apples, but they still had physics. The internal physical metals have their own interplay as well. 
Burning tin enhances all of a tin eye's senses, not just the ones they want. So it becomes much more about what you can ignore than what you can see. A pewter arm or thug may have increased strength and healing ability while they're burning, but once they run out, the impact from exhaustion can be deadly. Because of that push-pull relationship, the external mental metals can often either be used to accomplish similar things, either soothing away emotions you don't want, or rioting to the forefront those that you do. While burning, copper mistings are immune to this emotional touch, though with a copper cloud around, bronze mistings or seekers won't be able to sense alimentic pulses from anyone in the area. A good reason to hang out with a smoker. Interesting things start to happen if a misting burns too much. The constant stream of investiture causes changes in the user which can be quite dramatic, depending on the metal. This is called savantism. For most users, constantly burning their metal may result in a slight increase in strength, range, or control. For tin and pewter, though, actual physiological changes or dependency can occur. By the end of the first Mistborn trilogy, so spoilers if you haven't finished, they discover five more metals that the Lord Ruler had been suppressing. The eleventh metal, an alloy of atium and gold called malatium, the true pair of gold, electrum, as well as the incredibly expensive at this point aluminum and duralumin, which while researching for this video I discovered I'd been pronouncing wrong for years, duralumin. Sounds so much cooler. With gold and electrum, we finally have our first pair of temporal metals. Gold internally pulling your past into view, and electrum pushing your future back to you. Basically like atium, but for yourself rather than others. The atium is paired with a new god metal, lurasium, which has the side effect of turning a mister into a mistborn when burned. Aluminum and duralumin give us our first enhancement metals, both internal. Aluminum pulls your metal reserves away, and duralumin pushes whatever metal you're burning into overdrive. By era two, these have become well known enough to have their own terminology and applications. Gold mistings are known as augers, presumably related to the root word of august, like venerable, rather than auger, something that drills holes in things. Then again, you might be able to get some miles out of that second definition. Anyway, electrum burners are called oracles, which implies to me perhaps a little wider of an application than just counteracting atium. Both aluminum and duralumin mistings are called gnats. Being able to burn metals that are only useful when burning other metals would be pretty annoying. You wouldn't really be an allomancer, more like an annoyomancer. Huh. There's probably room for some fan fiction there. With the progression of technology, by the beginning of Era 2, the four final metals have also been discovered, finishing the bottom row of our table. Nicrosyl and chromium as external enhancement metals, and cadmium and bendeloy as external temporal metals. Just hearing those descriptors should basically tell you what they do. Nicrosyl and chromium follow the same pattern as their internal analogs. Nicrosyl pushes another person's burning metals up to 11, a nicroburst, and chromium pulls their metal reserves away, leecher. Cadmium and bendeloy start to get really cool, and probably are what's going to enable faster than light technology. A cadmium burner, or a pulser, is able to pull on time itself, creating a bubble around them where the progression of time is slowed down. This makes everyone outside the bubble appear to move incredibly fast, and from the outside looking in, motion would be virtually unnoticeable. This bubble can be pretty massive, as big as a large room, or maybe as big as a spaceship? Bendeloy mistings, called sliders, can push a bubble of time around them, speeding it up. These time bubbles are typically smaller, only about five feet across, and appear to slow time down for everything outside the bubble. These bubbles, both cadmium and bendeloy, must either absorb or emit energy as things pass through them. This is why occupants of time bubbles don't get irradiated due to redshift, light frequencies getting pushed into higher energy states, as well as stopping anyone from using speed bubbles as low-tech rail guns. If you throw or shoot something out of or into a speed bubble, its speed is the same relative to the speed of time in its surroundings, though its trajectory is randomly altered as it passes through. You may think this would be because as an object moves from high to low speed or low to high, the forces acting on different parts of the object would cause its motion to change. But Brandon has explicitly stated that, for example, 
a spear would go from one to the other, but would never be in both. This gets into some pretty interesting realmatics, which if you haven't watched my realmatic theory video, now might be a good time. To sum up, it all comes down to the nature of the Cosmere. All things exist in three realms. That means everything, from the tiniest pebble to entire planets, presumably, also have at least some level of self-awareness, which can change depending on life's collective perception of it. So when it comes to speed bubbles, an object is either in or out, and it depends in part on how the object views itself. So going back to that spear, this means that somewhere along its length is a point that the spear considers the center of itself. And when that point passes out of the bubble, the entire spear considers itself outside. So where is that point? This is where we'll get more into theory. Or at least it used to be theory until Brandon canonized it when I asked him about it at the Starsight release. Mm -hmm. One view would be that the center of self and the center of gravity reside at the same point. So the moment more of the mass of that spear is outside the bubble than in, it would consider itself all out. That's simple, clean, and easy to generalize. But in thinking about this, I kept going back to a point in Mistborn Era 1 that I was never really able to reconcile. When Vin, or any Allomancer, burns steel, or iron, technically, blue allomantic lines appear, pointing at nearby sources of metal. These lines, the book specifically states, connect to her chest, and roughly the same point on Kelsier. Vin and Kelsier for you purists. However, the center of gravity on a biological female is lower, meaning steel lines should point more towards Vin's stomach or hips. Allomantic lines then can't point at the center of gravity, but instead must be connected to the individual's center of self, their cognitive center. That makes sense, right? If I ask you to point to yourself, where are you pointing? Right here. Heart center. Namaste. That's where you consider you to be. This may have implications on a lot of the metallic arts. Uh, Vin's whirling horseshoe tornado of death actually makes more sense to me now. If she's pulling from her chest rather than from her center of gravity, the metal would have a much easier time not hitting her in the back of the skull. The flips and things Kelsier is able to do with that bar at the end of book one work out better too. His steel pushes and iron pulls are naturally off-center. So in terms of leverage and angles, he would have much more control than if pushing from his waist. Thinking about that spear, no, the example spear, its cognitive center is more likely closer up to the actual spearhead. Without that, it's just a staff. So the moment it switches from inside to outside the speed bubble could be much sooner. This concept of cognitive center gets even more interesting with hemallergy, but We'll get to that in the next video. Thanks all for watching. Like and subscribe. Share with your friends. Maybe point them to some of my other videos, like this one. And if you haven't yet, get a copy of Starsight. It's awesome. So go read and find out.